I want to call it things like triggers, and that's fine if that's helpful for you. Uh, but the Bible calls it temptations to sin. And it's not from this abstract idea. We have a tempter in this world that the Bible calls the devil. The Bible calls Satan. He is an enemy of all who have been made in God's image. Everyone in here, he is your enemy. And he wants nothing more than to destroy your life. And so tonight we are going to look at Jesus' temptation from the devil and how he overcame. And the message is this, is that in Christ we too can overcome. In Christ and in Christ alone we can overcome Satan and our temptations to sin. And so look with me, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we are weak people who struggle daily with our own flesh, our own sin. We struggle daily with the temptations of the world. And Lord, those are enough for us. Those are enough for us to battle against. And yet we still have another challenge in this world, and that is the devil himself. First, Lord, I want to pray that we would all take seriously this real living enemy. To not think for a second that he is not real or that he is mythological or some way to try to manifest the idea of evil. But he is a real person with real tactics and strategies, real desires to destroy all first who love Jesus and all who have been created in the image of God. And so Lord, I pray that we would understand better tonight who our enemy is and the temptations that he wants to fill our lives with. And that we would see in Christ the great victor over Satan. The one who has conquered Satan. The one who crushed the head of the serpent. And we would find our victory not in ourselves but in him. So help me preach your word tonight. I ask in Jesus name. Amen. There's an old, old book. It's called The Art of War. And it was written by this man named Sun Tzu. And here's what he said in that book among many things. He says, if you don't know your enemy, you will lose every battle. If you don't know and you don't understand your enemy, you will lose every battle. And that makes sense, right? If you don't know who you're fighting against and you don't know their tactics and their strategies and how they are going to wage war against you, then you have no chance of defending yourself and you have no chance of going on the offense either. And so I'm convinced that many addicts and many people who struggle with all kinds of sin struggle and will relapse because we don't know who our true enemy is. We've been convinced by many secular ideas of addiction and recovery when really there is a spiritual foe, there's a spiritual enemy who wages war against our soul. I'm talking about the devil. The devil is a real person. He's just as real as Jesus himself. Jesus made it very clear that Satan wants nothing more than to kill, steal, and destroy. And and here's what he wants for your life. He wants to see you in bondage. He wants to see you addicted. He wants to see you in jail, prison, and institutions. He wants to see you separated from your children. He wants to see you not in your right minds as you once were. He wants to see you each and every day struggling and hurting and in pain and suffering. That's what he wants for you. 
And most of all, what he desires above all things is that you die without Christ. That's what he wants for you. Satan, as I mentioned, is not a mythological figure that belongs to fairy tales and legends. Jesus said that he is the father of lies. He is a murderer from the beginning. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brothers. He is a real person with real tactics, and he wants to destroy your life. The Bible says this, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's 1 Peter 5.8. He's a true enemy. And he wants to tempt you. He wants to pull you away from God. But here's the encouragement tonight. Is that though we are weak and susceptible to Satan's temptations, there is one who never fell to the devil's tricks, and that is Jesus Christ. Every person who's ever lived... Every man, woman, and child who's ever walked this planet fell to his temptations except Jesus. In the garden, Adam and Eve, they failed. They fell. And every single person after them failed, fell into sin, except for the second Adam, except for the one true man of God who is Jesus Christ. He stood against Satan's temptations. He did not succumb to the devil's tricks. And then ultimately he crushed Satan on the cross. And if you want victory over your sin, if you want day by day, moment by moment, victory over your sin, it's only going to be in Christ. He is the great champion. He is the hero of our faith. He he is the general who leads us into battle and we follow and he guarantees our victory. And apart from him, we can do nothing. And so tonight I want to look with you at this passage of scripture of, of Jesus facing Satan because What is going on here is so much more than just a a short encounter between the devil and Jesus. What, What Matthew is showing you here is that this is the one that we must follow if we are to have victory over not just Satan, but sin and death itself. So just to give you an idea of what's going on here, this is really important. Um, Jesus has just been baptized. He's just come to John the Baptist at the Jordan. He's been baptized in that moment. Uh, The Spirit of God descends upon God the Son and anoints Him for ministry. God opens the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son. With Him I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit has clothed Christ and set Him up and and prepared Him for His mission as the Messiah. And it's it's in this moment that the devil comes to tempt Him. And I I just want to make a point here, friends. And you know this well. How many of you know when you're trying to live for God, that's when Satan comes at you? Right? Satan is coming at Jesus at a pivotal point in his ministry. He is getting ready to begin preaching, casting out demons, healing the sick. He's getting ready to show the whole world who he is. And it's at this moment Satan comes. And here's what I want you to understand. If you're going to live for Christ tonight, prepare for, for, prepare for attacks from your enemy. You are going to enter into a spiritual battle. But it's a battle that's been won. It's a battle that you can have victory in. So I want to show you some temptations from Satan. I'm going to give you three of them. Three temptations, and then at the end, three ways to fight those temptations. And here's the first one. Number one, the devil will tempt you to take your eyes off of God. The devil will tempt you to take your eyes off of God. It says, then Jesus, verse one, look back with me. Then Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted By the devil, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Well, I'd say so. That's one of the biggest understatements I've ever read in Scripture. And it says, The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. So Jesus is fasting. And one of the reasons he's fasting is because he he himself is preparing for his ministry. And he's spending time with God. He is spending intimate time and fellowship with his Father. And it's during this time of fellowship... And weakness, I mean, imagine, Jesus is the Son of God, but he's also fully man. And so for him not to eat for 40 days, he's weak, he's tired. And it's in this moment, Satan comes to him, and he tempts him. Hey, turn those stones into bread. I know you're hungry. It'll fill your stomach. Listen, Satan loves to come against us when we're weak and when we're alone. That's why in recovery, guys, listen... 
isolation is a killer. The moment you begin isolating yourself is when you open yourself up to the devil's temptations. The devil loves when you're by yourself, and he loves when you're weak. And it's in those moments he will come against you. And so he comes to Jesus, and he tries to tempt him to turn stones into bread. Here's what's interesting. It would not have been sinful for Jesus to do this. It would not have been wrong for Jesus to turn these stones into bread. I mean, he's a son of God. He's a creator of the universe. He can do what he pleases with his creation. I mean, later in the Gospels, he's going to make fish. He's going to make bread. He's going to turn water into wine. He's going to do all kinds of things to produce food. It's, he can do whatever he wants with his creation. So why would the devil tempt him to do this? I think it's really simple and it's very clever. He's trying to get him to take his eyes off God. He's trying to get him to break his fast because he's fasting to spend time with God as a spiritual discipline. And he's trying to get him to break his fast and take his eyes off of God. That's exactly what he wants to do with you. Satan wants to distract you. And here's what he'll do. And here's something we really need to be aware of is he will use even, quote unquote, good things to take your eyes off of God. Bread is good, isn't it? It's not sinful. And so, so often we think, well, the devil, he's trying to always tempt me to do evil things and nasty things and wicked things. And that may be true, but here's what he ultimately wants. He wants you to have a broken fellowship with God. That's what he wants more than anything. And so if he can use things in your life like, oh, I want to go make some more money. Or I want to have this relationship. Or I have some extracurricular activities that I would rather do instead of my my spiritual activities that have been benefiting me so much and I'm going to go to, to this place or hang out with this person. I'm going to skip church or Bible study or my recovery meetings or whatever it may be, time with my mentor because I have other things that are exciting and going on. That's all the devil needs to do to get your eyes off of God. You see, he doesn't need to tempt you with wickedness. He just needs to get you from participating in a relationship with Christ. That's all he wants to do because he knows that when you start to fumble on your relationship with Jesus, what's going to happen to you? He's going to be able to tempt you to sin. And so that's his first temptation. He wants you to take your eyes off of God. Number two, the devil will tempt you to doubt God. Look at verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Satan takes Jesus to the highest temple in Jerusalem, sets him on the pinnacle of it, and he says, throw yourself down from here because when you do that, God will send his angels, and he's misquoting scripture, but that's beside the point. He'll send his angels to save you, and you'll be able to prove to the whole world that you're the son of God, if you truly are the son of God. If that's who you truly are, he says that more than once, if you're the son of God, do this. And so there's a sense in which Satan is trying to plant seeds of doubt in his mind that you're not really the son of God. Because remember what just happened. He was just baptized. And what did God say? This is my son. And Satan comes in and says, are you really his son? He's trying to plant doubt. And this is what he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. Remember what he said? Did God really say? Did God really say you couldn't eat from that one tree? Did he say you die? You're not going to die. That's not what's going to happen. Casting doubt upon his word. Maybe you're here doubting God tonight. Maybe you're doubting God's goodness. And let me, let me show you how this works. Satan will tempt you to doubt that God's ways are best for you. He will tempt you to doubt that a life of obedience and faithfulness to Christ will lead to your highest joy and spiritual flourishing. And he'll want you to believe that a life living for yourself and living for sin will make you more satisfied. I told you last week about a girl I named named Julie, or a girl I knew named Julie, and how she was living for Christ and going to these meetings and how she was talking about how Christ was working in her life. But then all of a sudden she started wanting to have relationships and she was feeling um, anxious to be physically satisfied, as we all are. And then she started doubting God. Well, maybe God's ways aren't best for me. Maybe Jesus isn't even real. And since she walked away from the faith completely to pursue her sin, and like I told you last week, I've never seen somebody destroy their life quicker than her. 
And so Satan wants you to doubt God's goodness in your life so that you will walk away from God and pursue your own choices. But that, as you already know, is a recipe for disaster. That is a pathway to destruction. And here's what I want you to understand tonight is that you can trust the Lord. Friends, listen to me. The Lord is good. And he's faithful. He's righteous and he's loving and he knows what is best for his children. Listen to this from Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7 from the prophets. It says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. Psalm 34, verse 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Trust in him. He's good. He's worthy of your trust. Temptation number three, the devil will tempt you to believe lies. Verse eight, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he said to him, all these I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. So his final temptation is a big one. He tells Jesus, as he looks out over the kingdoms of the world, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you everything that you see. I've always found this temptation interesting. Because Satan, though he's described as the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, he doesn't have this authority. He doesn't have the authority to give any nations or kingdoms. They're not his to give. All these things belong to God, but it doesn't surprise me that Satan, the father of lies, would lie. That he would propagate untruth, even to Jesus. And one of the biggest lies that he will tell you is the same kind of lie that he told Jesus... You can be happy without, dis- without obeying God. Look what he's trying to get Jesus to do. Worship me and I'll give you everything. Fall down before me and I will fulfill all of your desires. And he says the same thing to you. Walk away from God. Pursue your own desires. Pursue your own lusts. And you will have everything. Satan loves to set traps. He loves to dangle the carrot. So that we'll snatch it up and then he has us in his clutches. If we believe the lies of Satan, all it is going to bring us is heartache and pain and destruction. The Bible makes it very clear that if we live in such a way, we'll not go to heaven. Look, listen to what Galatians 5 says. It says, now the works of the flesh, the works of our sin, the works that Satan is tempting us to live in, listen, are evident, sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Listen, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the way Satan wants you to live because he doesn't want you to inherit God's kingdom. So he's going to to tempt you to take your eyes off God. He's going to tempt you to doubt God. He's going to tempt you to believe lies. So what should we do? I'll give you three things briefly. Number one is we should hold fast to the word of God. Look back at verse four. Satan tempts Jesus to break his fast and look how Jesus answered him. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knows that Satan's temptation has far more to do than just with food. This is more than about food. This has everything to do with his relationship with God. And so that's why Jesus answers him with scripture from the book of Deuteronomy. He says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word from the mouth of God. Why would Jesus say that? Because he knows Satan is trying to get him to take his eyes off God. He says, no, I have a spiritual food that is far more nourishing and satisfying than what you're offering. And so my encouragement to you is to continue to seek God in his word. This is why when you come here, this is why I preach the Bible to you every single week. This is why we hand those little pieces of paper out to you when you come in. And I'm always going through a text and working my way verse by verse through it. Because I want you to have the word of God. Because this is where we meet God. 
we meet God in his word. And then his word is what spiritually nourishes our souls. First of all, his word has the power to save us. And then his word also has the power to continue helping us grow in Christ's likeness. And the more filled you are with God's word, the more fortified you will be spiritually to stand against Satan and his schemes. Listen, I haven't met too many people that relapsed and went back to their addiction who woke up and read the Bible, prayed, went to their job like they were supposed to, called their mentor, called their friends, went to their meetings, went to church that week. I haven't met too many people that went back to their addiction and said, yeah, before I did, I did all those things too. You know what they did? They stopped doing those things. They stopped doing those things. They stopped reading the Bible. They stopped praying. They stopped calling people who helped them. They stopped going to places where they were spiritually uplifted and hearing the word. They cut themselves off. And here's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't have a Bible in front of him and said, hang on, Satan, let me pull this out. You know where his Bible was? It was in his heart. He stored up the word of God in his heart that he might not sin against God, is what the psalmist said. Put the word in your heart. This is why we give you these booklets to work through in this program. Have you noticed that there's a lot of scripture in it? Have you noticed that it's saturated with the word of God? It's intentional. So store up God's word, honor the Lord with by honoring his word. Secondly, honor the Lord. His second temptation. Look how Jesus answered him. He said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Remember, Satan says, throw yourself down. Prove that you're God's son. His angels will come and they'll save you. And what's Je- what Jesus say? You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. What's the opposite of that? Trust him. Satan says, make God prove himself. You know what Jesus says? No, I'm going to trust him. And many of you need to trust God instead of making God prove himself. I was just talking with somebody today that is facing a situation with their marriage or potential marriage. And they have a choice right now either to continue walking down the path that they are and choose sin or they can turn away from that situation. I'm not going to describe what it is. And they can trust God. And some of you are faced with situations like that maybe right now or every single day where you have the opportunity to walk away from whatever you're doing right now that's helping you or you can continue to trust God even though you don't understand what's going on. Trusting God may not be the easiest thing to do, but I can promise you it's the best thing to do. Because if you're like me and you try to run your own life, We all know where that's got us. Remember what the proverb says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll make straight your paths. The Bible says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Third thing we do is worship the Lord. Verse 10. After Satan tempts Jesus to worship him, Jesus responds, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He resisted his lies. He resisted his temptation to worship him because Jesus was fully committed to God. And here's here's what I would encourage you guys to do tonight. Commit yourself to the Lord. Right now where you're at. To quit hedging your bets on whatever it may be. Maybe you have some ideas in your mind. We always do this. We call them reservations, don't we? We have these reservations in our mind like, "Ah, just one day I think I'm going to go back to whatever it was that you were doing. I'm going to go back to this relationship. I'm going to go back to you, and I think I can handle it this time. I think if I just adjust things and do things a little bit differently, and and you're hedging your bets, you have these reservations, and you know what these reservations are eventually going to do? They're going to take you back out to where you once were. And Satan loves to use those reservations. But I would ask you tonight to take those to the Lord and say, Lord, put these to death in my life. Lord, cast Satan out of my life. Make good on your promise. Listen to what promise James tells us. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a promise in scripture from God. If you will give yourself to God, 
And that's how you resist the devil, by the way. If you'll give yourself fully to Christ, the devil will flee from you. And you can put to death those desires that want to take you back to destruction. But if you flirt with them and you allow the devil into your life to play games and you think that just like the, the proverb said, I can carry coal next to my chest without being burned, then eventually you will be burned. Christ is the great victor. Christ is the great savior. Commit yourselves to him tonight. Flee from the devil. Flee from those temptations. Commit yourself to Jesus.